said, I'm going to begin reading here in John chapter, uh, chapter 21 at verse 1, just verse 1, because I'm going to introduce some things to you as uh, we continue our series, really in the Gospel of Mark and all, but I'll share that with you as we, we begin our study. So let me begin by reading verse 21 in John, uh, verse 1 in John 21. Uh, John writes, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way, he showed himself. And so as we've been going through the uh, Gospel of Mark, we already have come really to its conclusion. And as I mentioned, I'm filling in a few events that Mark didn't record in his Gospel. It gives to us a closer look at what took place after the resurrection. You see, each of the Gospels give different insights into the things that Jesus did after his resurrection. And as we have seen, Jesus didn't descend immediately after. In Acts 1, verses 1 through 3, Luke wrote that he was giving an account of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So as we've been going through some of those things, we've already seen how he had appeared to two of his disciples as they were on their way to the city of or the village of Emmaus. We've seen how he appeared to some of his men on his resurrection day. We've also seen how a week later he appeared again to his men as well as to Thomas. So today... We're going to look at what happened next, and that's found here in chapter 21. Now, this chapter was written for at least two purposes. First, it was to record the full restoration of the apostle Peter to ministry. And second, and I can touch this very briefly, to correct an error that was concerning the apostle John. You see, if you look at verse, verse 20 in chapter 21, it said, uh, Peter turned it around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on, his, leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? So he was actually uh, dealing with the rumor that John would never die. So, as we look at this, on the night that Jesus, bet rather Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter had boasted, remember that, and I'm going to lay this as a foundation. He had boasted that he would never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 13, 37, he went so far as to say, I, I will lay down my life for you. Now, when he said this, obviously, he was <laughs> completely sincere, because later on, when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter had drawn a sword trying to keep Jesus from being arrested. Now, after Jesus had told him to put away his sword, remember that Peter forsook him, and he had fled. Now, later, Peter and John had followed behind as Jesus was led to the home of Caiaphas, and he had been taken there, as we know, to be interrogated. John had gained entrance for both of them. Peter entered the courtyard. It was there that Peter denied the Lord three times, even as Jesus had said. Now, Luke tells us what happened after Peter denied Jesus the third time. Now, Jesus, at this point, had already been spit upon. He'd already been beaten. And he was being led past the apostle Peter there in the courtyard. In Luke 22, 61 and 62... It says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That word looked, I pointed out before. It means he stared intensely at him. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter went out, and he had wept bitterly. So as Jesus had stared deeply at him, his heart had been revealed, and his heart had been pierced. And in a moment, his weakness and sinfulness became crystal clear to himself. And as I've already said, that was the last time Peter saw Jesus alive before his crucifixion. So his last memories had to have been shameful, painful. He did what he swore he'd never do. He abandoned and denied him. 
Now, Jesus had told him that Satan had asked for and obtained permission to sift him. But Jesus went on to give him a word of encouragement. Luke twenty-two thirty-two. 32, Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, he's saying, Peter, as high priest, I have made intercession to my father on your behalf. This failure will actually make you a source of encouragement to the others. Your failure will produce empathy, understanding, humility, as well as compassion in you. So after his failure, Jesus had sent a message to him. We saw that in Mark 16, verse 7, where an angel told Mary and the other women to go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So at that time, Jesus was sending a personal word of comfort to the apostle. Now in Luke 24, 33 and 34, the Emmaus disciples had seen Jesus. They went and told the apostles. They told the apostles who were gathering that they had spoken to him. And the apostles responded, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. As I've mentioned, the conversation isn't revealed, but we can assume that it was at that time that Jesus was restoring him. Now, I want to develop this with you by pointing out that the concept of restoration or returning to original condition, that's what it means to restore. The concept of restoration, well, restoration can be divided in at least two elements. We need to know that sin breaks fellowship with God, so restoration begins first with God. When a believer is taken in sin, the result will be a broken relationship. So in order to restore fellowship with God, we're to repent and we're to confess our sins. If I confess my sin, I, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin. And when that happens, I have a, a restoration, a restoring to a condition of relationship with God. And so fellowship with God is a confession away. If somebody has drifted and somebody has broken fellowship through willful sin, what we do is we say, God, be merciful to me. I sincerely repent. I ask for your forgiveness. And the moment I pray, I'm re my restoration relationship has been completed. I, I once again have access to the Lord in that, in that beautiful and pure way because the sin has been dealt with. So restoration begins with the returning of a relationship with God, and it's immediate. But restoration to ministry is more often a process. And what we're going to see today is not simply the restoration of the apostle Peter to relationship with God, but we're going to see some elements of what it means for him to have been restored to his ministry. And that's what we're looking at in this particular portion of Scripture. So beginning at verse 1 again, reading it again and looking at it, it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a cough for some reason. It must be contagious COVID. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I'm just plain. I have to take a particular... Um, medicine and it causes me to cough and today for some reason it is but let's look at this and I'll try and keep my voice down a little bit because that's what provokes it this begins in the north it's at what is called the Sea of Tiberias now when you read your Bible you're going to notice that the sea to the north we know it better as the Sea of Galilee but it's known by different names including the Sea of Tiberias it's just another name for it. Actually, it's the Lake of Tiberias. The lake of, it's called the Lake of Gennesaret. Uh, it's called the Sea of Galilee. And so what we have here is him at the Sea of Tiberias. It's the lake. Now, why would it be called that? While well, Tiberius was a Roman emperor, there was one who was at rule named Herod the Tetrarch. He, his portion of, of, uh, of authority was up in the north by the Sea of Galilee. And so what he did is he named the sea 
the Sea of Tiberias after honoring or for honoring of uh, this Roman emperor. So as we've seen, the men have been commanded already to go to Galilee. So that's where they are right now. They're in the north. And as we're looking at this, Peter is the main character. Now, as we look at this in verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, also referred to as Didymus, which simply means twin. In other words, there were two of them. They're both ugly. Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. So it just points out that there are, are a number of these fellows together. Five of the, them are named uh, as the apostles. But notice how he added two unnamed disciples. There are those who believe these two unnamed are Andrew and Philip because they're from that area, but it doesn't say. That's just a, a conjecture. And so John says they're all together, verse 2, most likely in Peter's home in Capernaum. We've already seen that there were events that took place in this home. And so as this is taking place, they had been all together, more than likely at Peter's home in Capernaum. And this time, Thomas is there. And so as this is taking place in verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. So they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night, they caught nothing. So Simon Peter determined that he was going to go fishing, which we know was his, his, his job, his vocation. We saw that when he was introduced in Matthew 4, 18 through 20. And so he, as he often does, takes lead here, and he decides to go back to work. Now, there are those who would ask the question, what provoked him to do this, to spend the night fishing? And so the commentators will say, had he, had he forgotten that Jesus had commissioned him? Because Jesus had just breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he had said to them, uh, those whose sins you retain, they're retained. Those whose sins you remit, they are remitted. He had already given to them a kind of a, a commission. And yet there he is going out and he's going back to basically his old, his old job. Was he impatient? Waiting for Jesus to show up? Did he need to go to work so that he could provide income for the family? You see, Jesus hadn't shown up yet, and it may be that he felt he needed to go to work. Now, one commentator said it could have been an evidence of a lingering sorrow. He may have needed to get his mind off of his recent failures. We don't know for sure why he went back to work or why he influenced these men to go with him. All we know is he decided to go to work and his friends followed after. And that's why in verse 3 they said to him, we are going with you also. So the men are following his lead and they decided that they too would go fishing. So once again, we see the power of the Apostle Peter's influence. Now leadership at its core is the ability to exert influence upon other people. That's what leadership is. You can be called a leader but if you don't exert influence, you're not leading. Somebody once said, if you think you're a leader, turn around and see if anybody's following. Because leadership is influence. It's not just giving somebody a title. It's the influence that they wield. Every military person knows this, that if you're in the military and you have uh, somebody who just came out of uh, officer training, uh, school, OCS or whatever, comes out of officer training, and you have somebody who's a, a sergeant, sergeant major, or whatever, you're going to basically listen more to the veteran, the one who has more experience. Even though the other one has rank, you're going to listen to the person with the experience. That's what you do. And the one who has the experience has earned the credibility because of his experience, whereas the other one has yet to prove that. So influence isn't just giving somebody a title. Influence is that in, invisible ability to cause people to react and act in certain ways through the power, perhaps, of your, of your personality. And it, it is something that produces an effect in an indirect way. It's not as if they're saying something, and it's not as, as if they've got some bars on their, on their uh, shoulders, but it's, it's really something that occurs because somebody is exerting this invisible strength, and that's what Peter had. He had influence, and he's using it. He's obviously an influential leader. He had established credibility. His fellow apostles easily followed 
is the lead. And so in verse 3, it says they immediately, immediately got into the boat, and notice that night they caught nothing. Now, I want to develop this because it has an aspect that I think is important and valuable. The kind of fishing they were doing is not with a fishing pole and a line and sinker and bait and like that. It's called net fishing. And uh, it's very hard work. It's very strenuous. It's extremely difficult. And it's something that takes a long time. It has all of those elements. But in order for it to actually be effective, net fishing requires teamwork. It requires more than just a single person. A single person can take out their fishing pole and they can do that, not net fishing. Net fishing requires a team of people who can do the work together. And so net fishing gives us insight into the work of the apostles because in order for them to be able to, to do the job, they need to work together. It isn't an individual thing. And, and in Christian service, it's never an individual thing. Anybody who wants to be a Lone Ranger Christian, do their thing on their own with no accountability or relationship, can eventually become a dangerous person because they're not accountable to anybody, because they're not working together. They're not taking ideas from one another, putting it together, coming up with the best solution, and then putting, them, putting that into practice. Ministry is very much like net fishing. That's why Jesus told them, you're going to become fishers of men. You're going to work together. You're going to have relationship. You're going to be synchronized. You're going to do the same thing. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It'll be prolonged. It takes some skill. But it gives us the insight into the work of the apostles. They're going to be doing the work of ministry as a team. They are going to work together. Now, when Jesus originally sent them out, he sent them out two by two. Mark told us in chapter 6, verse 7, that he called the 12 to himself, began to send them out two by two. In Luke chapter 10, verse, 11, uh, verse 1, rather, he sent out another group called the 70, but he sent them out two by two. And they were to enter the cities that he was going to. So Jesus had said, as I mentioned a moment again uh, ago, they said, he said, you're going to become fishers of men. To be successful, you need to work together as a team. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're fishing. And notice they're fishing all night. But verse 3 says they caught nothing. This has been used as a picture of laboring in ministry with no effect. So Jesus is about to teach all of them a lesson concerning serving him, ministering together. They labored all night, they were completely exhausted, and they were unsuccessful. Now, it's been said that Jesus makes himself known when we are in our greatest need. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He shows up when we need him, when we're at the end of ourselves. So they're working all night, verse 4. When the morning had now come, it's dawn, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. It's morning, their hope of catching fish is past. They don't see him. There are various reasons why they may not have seen him clearly. It may be still a little too dark for them to make him out. Maybe a haze of some sort doesn't say. But it's morning, and the hope of catching fish is past. And they don't recognize him. So Jesus shows up, if you will, to examine their progress, and he begins to speak to them. Notice verse 5. He asks them a question. Children, have you any food? You've been working hard. Do you have any fruit from your labor? And their answer is honest, no, we don't have any. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting when, it's, when he says it this way in verse 6. He says to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Cast it on the other side of the boat. What are you talking about? And the boat's not that large. Why would I have a large amount of fish here and not over here? Again, it doesn't make much sense, but we'll look at that in just a moment a little closer. 
You see, that had happened before. All the way back at the beginning of the ministry, when Jesus was beginning to select his apostles, it's recorded in chapter 5 of the book of Luke, how that Jesus was there on the shore, perhaps even the same basic shoreline that they're on right now. And Jesus sees this crowd of people beginning to gather, and he turns to his apostle Peter, and he says, he climbs in the boat, he's using it as his pulpit, and he says, cast off, after he finishes giving a, a message to these people, he said, and drop your nets. Well, you never drop your nets during the day. Why? Because it's obvious that sunlight, the fish will see the net dropping down. There's no way that they're going to see a net and climb into it. And so Peter, being who he is, says to the Lord, and again, I'm paraphrasing, he says to the Lord, listen, Master, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing. In other words, your carpenter turned preacher, but my whole livelihood is based on fishing. I have all of this experience that you have none of. I'm just letting you know in a respectful way that I think you're wrong. You're asking me to do something that makes no sense. I've been doing this job for a long time. All of that's packed into that kind of thing. We've been fishing all night and caught nothing. All of that is packed into this. But he goes on to say, nevertheless, at your will. And he casts off. When he does so and they drop their nets, all these fish begin to swarm into it. And you can almost see the excitement as they're beginning to draw up the net and all and all the fish, and then Peter stops for a second and realizes what just happened, and he turns and looks at the Lord, and there's going to be some kind of shock, amazement, even fear, perhaps, when he looks at this one who just told him to do something that made no sense and yet produced such fruit. Master, depart from me. I'm a wicked man. I have realized so many things about myself, including the fact that I commanded you when I should have obeyed what you commanded me. Depart from me. And that's when the Lord originally, or one of the original times that the Lord said to him, you're going to be fishers of men. I wonder, and we'll look at this even more in a moment, but I wonder if that didn't go through the mind of the apostle. How that Jesus had said, cast the net out before. In the beginning of their ministry. And now he's doing it again. I'm wondering if that might have had a tremendous impact. You see, Peter was overwhelmed. So obeying him, even when not understood, results in blessings. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not just some of it. Oh, well, you know, I... I think you need to understand that I'm in this particular profession and you telling me to do this right now just does, it goes against everything I believe or know. But when you have a sense that the Lord is saying, no, this is what you need to do, that's what you do. And God shows up in amazing ways. And he does faithfully. Well, when this happens, it may have triggered something because notice verse seven, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. So the disciple once again recognizes Jesus before Peter does, apparently, because John said, it is the Lord. But once again, the apostle Peter reveals his love for the Lord because he immediately went to him. Well, in verse 8, the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. 200 cubits in our measurement would be a couple hundred, or rather 120 yards or so offshore. It wasn't really that far. And they're towing that net that's caught all these fish behind. There are those who would say this is a picture of how God blesses our labor when we cast out that net to draw people to faith in Christ. Well, in verse 9, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. 
fish and bread may have reminded them of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. Once again, it could have triggered memories within them of how the Lord had provided in the past. The net that was filled with fish would remind them. The fish and the bread would remind them how God provides and God has done so in the past. And notice again in verse 10 how it says, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And so Jesus provided for them, but they added to what he had given them. They added to it from his increase because we always give back that which we have first received. Now as this is taking place, Simon Peter, verse 11, went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, it's interesting, I'm just going to make this as an aside, how it says they were large fish. May have had small fish too, but normally what would happen is when you would draw the net, there would be the good and the bad. They would throw away the, the bad, which would have been the smaller ones, and they would have kept the larger ones. The second thing, notice the number 153. Now, one of our guides once pointed out that during the time of Christ, that was the number of nations that the, that the Jews believed at that time existed on, on planet Earth, 153 nations. So this may be a picture of them evangelizing the whole world, going out into the whole world. Now, Peter went up and he dragged the net to land, again, full of large fish. So in his fleshly effort, he was strong enough to drag a heavy net, but spiritually, he had become unable to fish for even one man. And so, Jesus said, verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Once again, Jesus is ministering, giving an example of service. On the night that Jesus had been betrayed in John 13, Jesus had given that example when he had washed the feet of his disciples. And Jesus had said to them that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. And so Jesus is continuing demonstrating greatness in the kingdom by his service. So he's making them a meal and giving them that example. Now, verse 14 says to us, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the third time, John would be saying, that was recorded in his gospel. And so here we go, verse 15. So, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verse 15 says they had eaten breakfast and Jesus begins to speak to him. What we're going to be looking at as we're looking at this passage, a very important passage to look at, is the restoration of the Apostle Peter to service. I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume that when Jesus met with him previous we already looked at that, how 
the disciples knew that Christ had appeared to and spoken to and ministered to the Apostle Peter. We know that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, Paul makes reference to the fact that Jesus appeared to Cephas or to Peter, Simon Peter. I'm going to make an assumption, and I think I can do so with certain precision. I think I can, that when he met with him, there was a restoration of relationship. There would have been a time that Jesus had a personal time with this one. But what we're looking at right now is a restoration to something else. See, you can, you can fail as a Christian, and immediately when you say, oh, God, forgive me, a sinner, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The, the sin that had made a, a fellowship separation, because you know it and I know it, that even in human relationships, should I have a, a, a discussion with my wife that, that isn't proper, maybe I'm angry and I say something, that there's going to be a break of fellowship. I know that. She's going to have to repent and come back or else it's going to be that way forever. There has to be reconciliation. There has to be apology. There has to be a time of, of if it was a severe or something that was hurtful. Th there needs to be a time of healing. That, you know, you can't just say, well, I said I'm sorry. We know that. Any married person knows, well, I said I'm sorry. doesn't mean that much until it's demonstrated later on over time. You said you're sorry. Let's see if that's real. Now, that's not like you're trying to test and prove them. It's just that the fruit of repentance sometimes takes time to demonstrate itself. But in terms of the restoration between me and my God, that comes instantaneously when I fail and I say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. The blood of Christ is, has already purified me, and, and God has already recognized me as being justified in him, and I'm reconciled to him. And those things are effect, uh, effective immediately. But in human relationships, as well as in my relationship with the Lord, sometimes it's going to take a little while for me to understand the depth of what I've done as well as the depth of his grace. And, and I may have, as a Christian, I have failed. But as a minister, and this is what Peter has done, there needs to be an awareness of what has happened at a restoration for him or else he will not be effective. He needs to know that he's right with God and he has to get past the guilt of his denial. Again, I, I mentioned to you that restoration speaks of bringing something back to its original condition, and Jesus is about to restore Peter to service to him. You see, there'd been a public failure. There had been a public denial. And because of this, there, there needs to be a public confession as well as an open restoration. Now, he'd already spoken to Jesus, as mentioned, but the others were still aware of his failure. And Jesus is now going to openly restore him to serving him. Now, they had a meal together. We saw that in verses 9 and 13. They sat and they ate a meal together. I, I, I can't help but wonder about that meal because I think that, and, and again, this is something I'm assuming, I'm, I'm thinking that many of the meals, because they had so many together, they walked with Christ for over three years together, they ate together numerous times, All of us know that when you're sitting at a table, maybe it's Thanksgiving, maybe a birthday, maybe a Christmas, sometime when more of your family shows up, not just your nuclear family, but, but aunts or uncles, brothers, sisters, whatever, they, they show up. Many of us know that there can be an uncomfortable moment in that, or maybe prolonged, if there's a problem that somebody has with somebody else at the table. You know that. Sometimes you might even want to joke about it to try and open it up so that the, the wound can be cleansed. Some, you may say something silly. It doesn't always work either, does it? But you can. I wonder, and again, I wonder if at that meal there could have been an uncomfortable silence. I wonder. And they're eating their bread and their fish, which would remind them again of the miracles that Jesus had performed. And I wonder if the Apostle Peter, even though he's been restored to fellowship with Christ, if he feels still lacking in who he is as a man, as an apostle. Sitting there quietly there along the shore. There's a fire, there's fish. 
There's Jesus. There's the apostle. There's some of the men seated around. And perhaps in a quiet moment, but the perfect moment, Jesus looks at Simon, and he asks him a question. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Can you imagine that, how that awkwardness could be? Because even though they would have been with a tone of gentleness, sometimes it's the gentle words that tear the heart. If somebody's screaming at you, it's easy for you just to put your wall of defenses up. If somebody yells at you, you just think, shut up. You know, why are you yelling at me? You can do that. I know about you. Maybe it pierces you, but it doesn't me. If somebody's yelling at me, my defenses go up. And I'm just looking at them and go, okay, finish your yelling. Because, you know, you lost me on that one. But if they love you and they say it with kind gentleness, like when my wife has corrected me, it's different. My defenses don't go up. My heart opens up. I've heard her. There's something we need to talk about. And I listen. Because she's not accusing me. She's just asking me. And sometimes when a question is asked of you, the answer is revealing where you really are. Do you love me more than these? What is it that the Apostle Peter had said? Though all forsake you and flee, I never will. I love you. The inference, more than these men do. I'm Simon, the rock, Cephas. I received revelation. Don't you remember Caesarea Philippi? How I said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, and you had pronounced a blessing on me. Blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. I'm the one who receives divine revelation. And I am now telling you by what I know within the depth of my heart that all of these guys, if they forsake you, I never would. I love you so much, I would die for you. But so said all the rest. They all had. They had all said it. We'll die for you. We'll, we'll never forsake you. It, it's not so much that they said we'll die. We'll never forsake you. They all agreed they would never forsake him. But he went so far as to say, I would die for you. What are you saying? Well, I, I'm saying that I love you enough to lay my life down for you. Now, I want to develop this because when it says in verse 15, Jesus said, notice to Simon Peter. Well, he's speaking to him and it says, do you love me? Well, the first thing that he's saying would, would cause him to remember that, had, how Jesus had given him the new name. He had asked him the question by saying, Simon, son of Jonah, and I've already pointed this out, but when Jesus called him, he had given him a new name. In John 1, he had said, Simon, your new name is Cephas, which means a stone. But Jesus is now calling him Simon again but also son of Jonah. That gives us insight. Simon Bar-Jonah was what he was originally known as. I mentioned to you that the word Simon or the name means the one who hears or the one who is listening. But he is calling him Simon Bar-Jonah. Now, Jesus called Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon Bar-Jonah in Matthew 16, 17, when he blessed his confession, he said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. He had given him the new name there. Again, he had reiterated it. So what I find interesting is that he's calling him Simon Bar-Jonah instead of Peter. Now, why did he refer to him as a son of Jonah? He did so because Jonah was the prophet who tried to run away from his ministry. You're like Jonah. You're walking away. You're allowing whatever it is within you to move you from what you were called to do. You're like Jonah, the son of Jonah. You're like him. 
your spiritual ancestor in a sense in terms of just what it appears to be. God had called Jonah and said to Jonah, I want you to preach to Assyria. And what did Jonah do? He went the opposite direction, climbed on a boat, tried to make it to Spain, didn't make it. And so, like Jonah in the past, called to do something and refusing the call, Simon, remember who you are. Remember who you are and what I called you to do. Now, as he's speaking, we need to see ourselves for a moment on that shore. There's a boat. There's a net. There are fish. And that would remind him of when Jesus had first used his boat to catch fish. And it was in a similar setting that Jesus had told him how he would be used in Luke 5, 10, the second portion of the scripture. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. But also, there was a, a fire of coals. A fire of coals. Notice verse 9. As soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. You may not think that's very significant, but it is, and I'll tell you why. In John 18, verse 18, it reads, The servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Not only do you see the fish and all, but you're also seeing the fire of coals. Not only are you being called Simon by Jonah, one who's running from your call, but I'm also reminding you in a gentle way of what you recently did in your denial. You were at the enemy's campfire, and I believe that the Spirit inspired John to record those two things in his gospel so we could connect the two, the fire of coals of his denial and the fire of coals where Jesus restores him. Being at that spot reminds him of his call, but it also reminds him of his failure. Jesus is reminding him of his original call that he might remind him that he's still called. And in order for him to be the man he needs to be, and this is a very important point in Christianity, Jesus also points out his failure. In other words, he's meeting him where he is. He confronts him, but exposes him only to heal the pain and restore him. Because if you don't fully realize your sin, you will not fully realize the depth of healing. So he asks him a question, Simon, verse 15, do you love me? Simon, do you have agape? The word agape is the highest form of love you find in the New Testament. There are those who say that the word agape was actually a word that was coined for the love that God has for man. And Simon, do you have agape for me? But notice he says, yes, Lord, I, I know. You know that I phileo. The word phileo is, is a lesser kind of word. It, it has less devotion attached to it. Phileo is a friendship love, it's a companionate love, it's a love that is deep, but it's not as deep and pure as agape. Simon, do you have agape for me is the first question. The answer is I have friendship for you, a deep and affectionate love for you like a brother loves a brother. You know I love you. I, I can't claim to love you more than these, but I love you. And even though I denied you, I still have a deep love for you. And as he's saying that, Jesus is basically meeting him where he's at. So he says, feed, feed. He wants him to take care of his lambs. Feed my lambs. Take care spiritually. Meet the spiritual needs of my babies. Because your love for me will be shown by your love for my little ones. And the way that you will love my lambs is by feeding them my word. Peter never forgot that because in 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3, he said, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Take care of my babies. I think one thing, and I'll make application of this in this way, one thing that we as parents, those of us who are parents, and even grandparents to some degree, 
One of the highest calls that I have and have had since God was gracious to bless our, our, us with a family, my wife and me with, with kids and now grandbabies, is to be the greatest influence that I can be to them. Fathers, I want to say that to you too. Those of you who are Christians, you men, feed God's lambs. Take care of his babies. The responsibility, because my wife and I are, are a composite unit, we're together. The two became one flesh. The importance of that rests very much on my, my shoulders. The raising of our children in the faith of the Lord should not have and is not and has never been just placed on my wife's shoulders. The importance of bringing my children up in the faith of Jesus Christ has always been on mine. So I gave them devotions. I prayed for them, ministered to them. And when they gave us problems, which they did, it was because of their mom, and, and I had to deal with that too. I took responsibility for all of that. It was never my wife's responsibility to give them devotions unless I was out of the country, if I was somewhere else. I've said this before, I'll say it briefly. My, my children received devotions every night of their life as they lived under my roof as children. There were only two nights that they didn't, Wednesday night and Sunday night, and those, those were nights that they were in church. And I still had a difficult time trying to keep them on the path, learning to respect them, and treat them as young adults when they became that, and to influence them. Take care, tenderly care for spiritually nourished, Jesus said, my young ones, which could include the babies. Just yesterday, my my granddaughter, who's soon to turn nine, my Zoe, got it into her heart that she wanted something from mom, grandma, and, and her papa. So she asked me to write my name. I said, when she's older, she's going to use this to forge it to get into my bank account. I know she's going to. But she said, write your favorite Bible verse for me. So I wrote my favorite Bible verse down. Write your name so I can have your autograph someday for my scrapbook of memories of my, my grandfather and my, my Grammy. So we both did. I put my favorite scripture, I signed my name. And she said, Papa, please write me something that I can read someday when I'm older. So I wrote, I love you, my baby. And I'll see you in heaven. Because that's for when I go home. She's putting it away. And one day she's going to open that up and she's going to see Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And a message from my pen to her heart that says, I'll see you in heaven, which is reminding her that's where I want to go and that's where she'll be, right? That's what you do. Because I know, it, and my, my daughter read it. I don't want to embarrass her by being too open, but when my daughter read it, her eyes well with tears. because She knows that that's my heart for my kids. She knows that. Can your children say that about you, Daddy? Can your grandchildren say that about you? Can they? If they can't, make it your aim that they can. Because that's your calling. Is to give them Jesus Christ. That's your calling. And so Jesus says to him, take care, tenderly, spiritually care, nourish for my babies, nourish my babies. He also goes on, I have to make it quick, I'm going long. I'll have to talk to the pastor about this. <laughs> he said to him in verse 16, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Out of love for me, nourish, protect, defend my sheep. Peter never forgot this either, 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd, the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly shepherd, tenderly care for the flock. Everything that we have here in this fellowship is for the benefit of you spiritually. Know that always. Everything. 
when we had a bookstore, we first put the bookstore in, people said, oh, that's because he's selling books to make a profit. That never was true. I wanted you to know what the word of God is, make it available to you. That's what the bookstore was for. But there will always be people who misunderstand things like that and have things to say. And it's just the pettiness of the human heart, I guess. The bottom line is, everything that we ought to do here is to make sure that whatever it is, whether it's even sports or whatever, that everything should lead you towards knowing Jesus better. Everything should lead you in that direction because everything in the world leads you away from him. So care for them. He said, govern them, protect them, defend them. And then the third time, he had said the same thing. Do you love me, Simon, son of Jonah? Do you love me? But this time he used the word phileo. And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He used the word that Peter was capable of affirming, the word phileo. The fact that Jesus used the, word, used the word pierced him, even grieved him. And he's saying, basically, you know my weakness. I can only say, yes, I love you. I love you deeply. Well, with that, you can now feed and tend my sheep because you're a broken man. You at one time were boasting how you would not ever deny me. Now you understand that you can, and that brokenness has made you capable of being used by me to, to heal those who have broken hearts also. And it's a command. It's a command not to go fishing. It's a command to go back to minister. His sin was great, but Jesus' grace-filled forgiveness is greater. Peter was broken, but now he's restored, and now he can be used. In Psalm 51, 12, and 13, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners shall be converted to you. Your sin was great, but his grace is greater still. Peter, we have fellowship. Now, Peter, go and serve me. And at the end, tradition holds that he did faithfully until he was crucified upside down for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you love me? Feed and tend my children and my sheep. That's what we're called to do. If you've been restored, feed a sheep. Father, we ask.